Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Happy morning. Sabbath. Mark, David, and I are delighted to be with you this morning. We just wish you all a blessed Sabbath. We please that you have decided to join us virtually and to study God's word through the Sabbath school lesson. David, yes. will you pray for God's blessings on this morning's study? Certainly, my pleasure. Loving Lord Jesus Christ, our Holy Father and the Holy Spirit, we are just in gratitude of the wisdom, the mercy, Amen. the love that you have shown us since the day you created us Amen. in your image and in your likeness. Lord, we're learning so much from your word, Genesis. Today we'll be tackling a subject that we learned since we're ch uh, children, Lord. Absolutely. But now, Amen. Amen. Lord, now, help us as we study this that we can understand that you love us so much that there is nothing you would do to save us, Lord. Amen. That is your character. That is your holiness. Lord, we ask that you be with all of us that are listening this morning. I ask that you give extra blessing to Mark, to Victor, and myself Amen. so that we can speak your word, not ours, Lord. Cleanse us from all our iniquities. Wash us and help us so that we can be the representative that you want us to be Amen. like Noah, Amen. like David, Lord. We thank you and we praise you and we ask you to be in our lips and in our mind. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, what a delight to be here with you. I, I, this lesson, I can tell you that I struggled with, not with the context and the content of the lesson, but there's so much we could learn from it. Yeah. And to really, uh, and I know that my brethren have done that too, and, and for, for, for us to really summarize it in a time that is effective and efficient, we may not do all justice to it. But we're going to do our best and we're going to do our try. And I know that the Holy Spirit has been poured to, to speak through us. The memory text this, morning's, uh, this morning is found in Matthew chapter 24, verses 37. Matthew 24, 37. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. And there's so much that can be said over, over this. I know that in my presentation throughout uh, the hour here with you, I'll probably reflect on this verse two or three times. And really, to me, for me, what it does say is that in spite of the warning sounded by Noah, over a 120 years, while the, the ark was being built and he was preaching, 120 years, and testified to by the construction of the ark, Human beings went about their usual round of work and pleasure without giving thought or considering events that were going to take place. They were all warned they were going to take place. Jesus is saying that the same unconcern would characterize human beings living in our days prior to his second coming. Their activities like those of the antediluvians, would, for the most part, be evil. That's really what this memory verse is saying. So here's a brief uh, overview of the week's Sabbath school lesson. Uh, and I'm going to just bring about um, um, historical factor here, which is so, so prevalent. After the event of, of the creation, and subsequently the fall, the disobedience of our first parents escalated until the world was filled with corruption and wickedness. From the time of Cain and Abel, humanity was divided into two camps. It is interesting that each genealogical line is defined on the basis of their relationship with God. Genesis chapter 4, verses 17 to 22 introduces the genealogy of Cain by his reaction of God. The Bible tells us in those verses, in verse 16 of uh, chapter 4 of Genesis, that Cain went out from the presence of God. He left the presence of God. And it goes on to say, um, the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod in the east of Eden. Genesis chapter 5, verses 1 
to 32 introduces us to the genealogy of Seth. Seth, as, as, as we know from uh, chapter 5 of Genesis, verses 3, is the only son who received the image of, Evan, of, of Eden. Therefore, Genesis chapter 5, verses 1 and 3, chapter 5, verses 1 and 3, refers to Seth's genealogy as the, in the likeness of God. So let's read those two verses, verses 1 and 3 of chapter 5. This is the book of the genealogy of Adam. In the day that God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Adam, in the likeness of God. We know that. Verse 3. And Adam lived 130 years and begot a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. Adam in the likeness of God, Seth in the likeness of Adam, which was in the likeness of God. This contrast explains why Genesis chapter 6 verses 1 and 2 identifies the line of Cain as the sons of men, whereas the line of Seth is identified as the sons of God. Here's what Genesis chapter 6 verses 1 and 2 tells us. Now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of man, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all of whom they chose. No wonder God was horrified when he sees that the two genealogies are getting mixed up and producing a new ge uh, geneal genealogical line that is in open rebellion to God. The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 and 6, that the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That is a remarkable statement. Continually evil. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. You see, when God saw what humans had become, he regretted creating them. It was as if human beings had not been created by God. Wow. The expression great wickedness does not refer just to some specific actions or occasional evil deeds. This expression describes a thorough and definite condition of the human heart. This expression is a concern for the root and the profound motivation of the heart, where God can only find radical evil continuously. God's next comment is a tragic evaluation of the situation. See, the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 6, verses 7 and 8, So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing, and birds of the air. For I'm sorry that I have made them, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Humanity had reached the point of no return. God must intervene with a worldwide flood to preserve a remnant of the human race from complete moral degradation and extinction. In God's estimation, the situation in Noah's day was so dire that the only way to solve the problem of, of the a uh, cursed world was to establish a new, a new creation. And so we read in Genesis chapter 6, verses 8, that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. In these words, mercy is sin, seen in the midst of wrath. In these words, God ple pledges the preservation of restoration of humanity. This is pure grace. You see, the example of grace and mercy is a source of assurance and hope for believers like you and I who live at the end of time, a time that Christ himself compared to Noah's time. So let's read it again. Matthew chapter 24, verses 37 to 39. But as the days of Noah were, 
so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Verse 38. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving into marriage, until the days that Noah entered the ark. Verse 39. And did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Our Bible study this week does not cover the biblical story of the flood in order for us to understand it from a scientific point of view. We just do not possess all the data that, we, that is able or to be able to comprehend this, this incredible phenomenon. What our Bible study lesson this week discusses, however, is of great importance to each one of us. And, here what it, and, and what, here's what it is. What this story of the flood and Noah teaches it is about God and his purpose for each one of us and for the world. Mark, preparation for the flood. Talk to us about it. Yep, thank you, Victor. Today, on, on Sunday, we're going to dig in, and really what we're going to learn is that we learn from Noah and what Victor introduced already is that we're going to be saved by having faith in God and doing what he commands us to do. Uh, Victor pointed out also, I'm going to reread it, Genesis 6 verses 5 through 8, the really the, kind of the reason why God knew that a flood had to, why he decided a flood had to occur. Let's read it once again. I'll, I'll say the same thing. I'll just, Genesis 6 verses 5. Um, then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent, the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. Everywhere there was evil. But if we skip to 8, if we skip to verse 8, verse, Genesis 6 verse 8, once again we know that Noah was saved. And how was he saved? He's going to be saved like each of us are going to be saved at the end of the world. So Noah was, like Daniel, predicted the end of the world. Um, and now Daniel's predicting the end of the world to come. And Noah predicted the end of the world that came, and that was the flood. And Noah was saved. So wh what did he do to make this to be saved? One, he had grace in the eyes of the, of the Lord, as we learned that. But now we're going to go to Genesis 6 and read through this story leading up to the flood. And we're going to go um, verses 13 through 19. I'm going to read through this, and then we'll discuss about it. And, go as, and God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, and the earth will be filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make the rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. And this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark is going to be 300 cubits. The width is going to be 50 cubits. The height is going to be 30 cubits. You shall make a window in the ark, and you shall finish it to a cubit from above and set the door of the ark in its side. And you shall make it with lower second and third decks. And be behold, I myself of bringing floodwaters to the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life. Everything that is in the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall go in the ark. You, your sons, your wife, your son's wife with you, and every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of you of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you, and they shall be male and female. So this ark was going to be built, and God gives us, um, gave, gave Noah specific examples of how that ark would be built. But actually, this is not the only time that we've had arks in the Bible. We've actually had several others, and let me show you one of them. Moses was, um, Moses had an ark, okay, in Exodus 2 verses 3, when he was a little baby, uh, when he, and, but when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes for him and dubbed, and dabbed it with asphalt and pitch and put the child in it and laid it in the reeds by the silver, uh, by the river bank. Here, Moses, in this case, was another savior, a savior for the Israelites to, um, you know, get out of bondage from Egypt. And he was using an ark there. Mm -hmm. Another ark is the Ark of the Covenant. And there's actually quite a lot of parallels between the verses that we've seen in building this ark today, uh, that Noah was building this ark to 
that time to the time when the uh, Moses asked for the children of Israel to build the Ark of the Covenant. Let's read in Exodus 5, 25 verses 10 and talk about this. And they shall make an ark of Achaia wood, two and a half cubits shall be its length, and a cubit and a half its width, and its cubit and a half its height. Remember, this is very similar to what Noah had to do. He had to do those very similar, different lengths, but still, and both of them were directed by God to do it. And in both cases, what did they do? And in Genesis 6.22, Noah, it, it tells us, and thus Noah did, according to all God commanded him, so he did. The word did here is a verb called a sigh, and it's used also for, out in Exodus, when we read about what the children of Israel did to create the, this Ark of the Covenant. They mean the same thing. There's lots of parallels to him. The Ark of the Flood will permit the survival of humankind. The Ark of the Covenant, as a sign of God's presence in, his, in the midst of his people, points to God's work of salvation for his people. Exodus 25, verses 22 says this very clearly. And there I will meet you. I will speak with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are on the ark of the testimony, about everything which I give you in commandment to the children of Israel. So we learn about what, what, we need, what Noah needed to do. He obeyed God's commands to do this. Let's read on and read else uh, further what did Noah did to obey. Genesis 7, verses 1 to 2, um, we're going to read, Then the, lo the Lord said to Noah, Come into the ark, and you and your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. You shall take it with you, seven of each clean animal, a male and a female, and two of each that are unclean, a male and a female. And then we'll skip down to Genesis 7, uh, of chapter 7, verses 7 to 10. And say, so Noah, with his sons, his wife, and his son's wife, went into the ark because of the waters of the flood, of clean animals, of the animals that are unclean, of birds, of everything that creeps on the earth. Two by two, they went into the ark to Noah, male and female, a God that commanded Noah. And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were on the earth. Noah, during this constant time, was listening and obeying God. Ellen White says in uh, Patriarchs and Prophets, God gave Noah the exact dimensions of the ark and explicit dimensions on regards to its construction in every peculiar. Human wisdom can, could not have de devised a structure of so great strength and durability. God was the designer. Noah was the master builder. In short, Noah was saved by his faith in God and his obedience to the instructions that God gave him. Like Noah, at the end of the world that is coming, God wants that for each one of us, to have that relationship with him, to listen to, to have that relationship and know those rules and laws that he's asked us, command us. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mark. Um, how interesting how it's, it's really so, so wonderful to know that God is behind his desire to save mankind in spite mm -hmm. of our condition. Oh, yeah. That he yeah. does every, makes every effort. David, um, you're going to talk about the event of the flood. So talk to us about the flood story and how it may apply to us. Yeah, what, a, what an amazing study. Thank you for uh, that, Mark. Excellent analysis yeah. of that. Um, you see, Spirit of Prophecy, Patriarchs and Prophets, it says, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Mm -hmm. And she says that people in the end times rejecting God's warnings and mocking his messengers, then it is that sudden destruction mm -hmm. cometh upon, upon them, and they shall not escape. See, the biggest and the most important thing for me, the takeaway is that it was unexpected. Mm -hmm. It was the parable of 10 virgins. Mm -hmm. So Daniel 12.10 talks about how the wicked will not understand, but the wise, the, the one that believes and obey God will. Mm -hmm. So Noah is actually the wise man mm -hmm. of his generation. And why? Because he heeded 
to the voice of God. So, let's continue. See, the event of flood actually begins in Genesis 6 and ultimately ends in chapter 11. But the main story is in chapter 7, and flood is the biggest event after creation and before the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. So, for me, flood represents the ongoing daily struggles of our life on this earth and serves as a blueprint for all human beings who wish to be saved and desire to spend eternity with Christ in the new heaven and the new earth. So, flood was recreation, regeneration. But guess what? We never seen the creation, but Noah actually was part of it, got to see it. See, uh, Mark mentioned the word asha, means make. You know, before Jesus came, John the Baptist make a way for Jesus. Here, Noah, who did his act, his part, to have that flood uh, become a reality. You see, he made the way for God to execute the divine plan of justice and mercy for the human race, just like Jesus created the earth with God and with the Holy Spirit. Creation is the teamwork of Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Recreation, we have this fallen man Noah involved in part of this process. Incredible, incredible. What a hope for us, right? Flood actually proved that even in our fallen state, we can be saved, we can reflect God's image and his likeness, like Mark said, through faithful obedience. So let's continue. Genesis 6.22, Mark read this that Noah did according to all that commanded. Who did? Noah did. Amazing. Amazing. In crucifixion, Jesus did all that the Father's will, uh, all of Father's wish. And when we do the wish of God, will of God, guess what? Our inheritance is waiting for us. Noah was able to be saved, and his inheritance was the new, recreated earth. Now, when we look at the flood. Let's read Genesis 7, 11. This is where the flood story actually starts. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, on that day, the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. So the author here um, actually makes a nice comparison mm -hmm. between the similarities of flood and the creation. Mm -hmm. See, the waters are divided in Genesis 1, 6, mm -hmm. but in flood, it was going back to the creation state, so waters came together. Then God created, in Genesis 1, animals according to their kind. But here God preserves the animals by calling them into the ark according to their kind. God also brought the animals to Adam after he created them. But here God destroys the animals because of human imperfection, the wicked nature. See, God had to destroy everything he had created so we, we can have... The Messiah come and save us mm -hmm. and take us to the new world. See, when I talk about this flood, you know, I probably have to touch this uh, a little bit. The Genesis uh, chapter 7, 11 is where it starts. An actual flood event ends at Genesis 8, 14. And it starts with the 600 year, second month and 10th day. Noah goes into the ark. He stays there for seven days. Then the rain starts and the water goes up up to 150 days. Then the water receded and the ark rested on Ararat, which was 600 years, 7 months, 17 days. Then it continues to go down and the water, then Noah can see the mountain tops. There's hope. Then he waits 40 more days and then he sends out a dove and a raven. Raven doesn't come back, but dove does. Then he waits 14 more days and he, um, to, he um, actually releases two more doves. And then finally... Uh, it took him 61 days to do all this. And then water dried up on the 601st year, first month, and first day of Noah's life. And then Noah waits one more month and 26 days before going out. And the, on the 27th day of his 61st, 601 first year. From the beginning to the end, flood lasted one year and 10 days. You know, that's interesting because one day, one year principle. Right? right? And so, yeah, when I read this, I try to, you know, look at things. Now, what is the flood about? Well, it is God's creative power is expressed here. And it's telling us that God is 
our creator. He can save us. Only he can do it. Deuteronomy 32, 39 says, I, I uh, put to death and I bring to life. He, nothing is hidden from God. The creation through flood is not based on what humans did. Um, it's not based on what uh, God wanted to punish us, but based on our evil, wicked nature, our rebellion, you know, against God. So flood is a universal event. You know, Victor said, we don't have enough information, and we don't. But lately, scientists are finding out that when you look at the layers of the rock, the layers are same in all different continents. They are in the same level. And the layers stack up perfectly against each other, on top of each other. We know if we come from evolution, there will be erosion. Yes. But these layers have no erosion, right. which is interesting. If you go to Grand Canyon, you will see it. I recommend this movie, The Flood, in Amazon by Seventh Adventist Church. Please watch that. Again, and, and then when you look at also the fossils by the marine animals, you see them on the top of the mountain because everything was covered with water. You see, the interesting thing is Nineveh. It took them three days to repent and be saved. But these people are so evil, so wicked that it took them even for 120 years, they, God could not, they couldn't, didn't come to God. It, it's just an amazing thing. As you know, God limited the age limit to 120 years. That was the first step of flood. Okay, Genesis 6, 3. Why? Because the longer people lived, the more bold and uh, they became, and the more rebellious they became. The second step was obviously the flood, and the third step will come next week, which is the division of language. This is how God kept the sin under check. Micah 6, 8 says, He has shown you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. See, to justly is to walk in faithful obedience, shown by the attitude of gratitude. And finally, to love mercy is to treat others according to the fruit of the Spirit. See, our goal is not to make a name for ourselves. Our goal is to bring more names to God, save more people by preaching righteousness of Jesus to them, his redemptive power. See, flood story proves that creator cares for his creation, even though the numbers may be very tiny. God was grieving for the lost souls. He wasn't happy to punish them. Flood shows what God, the nature of God is. He's long-suffering. He's kind. He is going to save his remnant that Victor mentioned. Flood taught us to accept, em embrace diversity. See, all these people are stuck in that, in that ark. So they had to endure the suffering. The animals, they had to coexist. And that was amazing. And we are told to also uh, live in a more simplistic life. And now, the Sabbath, to me, is a type of spiritual ark where there's God's promised rest and peace there. And we can take shelter there. So in the end, what is the practical application of the flood? Well, every single one of us are going through life in various st stages of flood event. Whether we are going through preparation for trials, or we are in trials right now, or we have gone through something painful, we are to remain faithfully obedient through the attitude of gratitude and humble ourselves so in due time, when Jesus comes, we can have our inheritance. So let's pray like David in Psalms 51, as he went through his own flood, own trials, and asked God to create in me a clean heart and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Thank you, David. Thank you. Well, uh, Tuesday's uh, lesson, of course, is a continuation of this theme. We're talking about the flood at the beginning, the flood itself, uh, and the end of the flood. And um, I, I want us to, um, to turn to Scripture to begin with, Genesis chapter 7, verses 22 to 24. And as Dr. David said so correctly, the flood lay in campuses, uh, chapter 6 to, to, to chapter 11, and uh, what a story of a salvation, the story of salvation and recreation. Yep. You know, one, one of the things that I liked about that is that the Lord doesn't say, uh, let's uh, refurbish. Yes. The Lord says, we're going to do away with and we're going to recreate. And that's going to be my heart and your heart, David, and your heart, Mark, as, as the Lord comes for each one of us. Yep. All right, Genesis chapter 7, verses 22 to 24. The last three verses of the chapter of chapter 7, this, they describe how overwhelmingly and comprehensively the waters destroyed all living things. So let's read it. 
verse 22. All in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life. In other words, the, the, the beings that could breed. All that was in the dry land died. Verse 23. So God destroyed all living things which were on the face of the ground, both man and cattle, creeping things and birds of the air. They were destroyed from the earth. Only Noah and those that were with him in the ark remained alive. And the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. Note that the ark rested somewhere, somewhere on the mountains of Ararat around the 17th day of the seventh month of year 600, exactly five months, 150 days. And by the way, the months here are calculated at 30 days a month after the beginning of the rain. And then chapter 8, verses 1, begins with this great statement. And let's read it. Then God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the animals that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind pass over the earth, and the waters subsided. It is against this background of total annihilation and helplessness that God remembered. This verse does not imply that God had forgotten Noah, or, or that um, he had for some reason just disappeared. No. This verse, this statement is an expression indicating grace and divine earnest concern and attention for Noah and every living thing in the ark. The statement is a touching indication of the tenderness of God toward his creatures. I hope you notice that this statement, God remembered, is situated in the center of the texts covering the flood. Chapter 8. It's the center of 6 to 11. This is an indication that God's grace and his divine earnest concern and attention for Noah and every living thing in the ark is the central theme and message of the flood story. God remembered. When the biblical text, text speaks about God remembering his creatures, it refers to God's act of salvation as he fulfills his promise at the appointed time. That's how God reacted as he was about to save Lot from the inferno of Sodom and Gomorrah, as we read in Genesis chapter 19, verses 29. This is how God handled it. And it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered. Same expression, same words. Abraham, he remember Abraham then, and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot was dwelling. You see, in the context of the flood, the statement God remembered means that the water stopped, as we read in Genesis chapter 8, verses 2. This verse tells us, that the fountains of the deep and the windows of heaven were also stopped, and the rain from heaven was restrained. God remembered means that Noah and every living creature would soon be able to leave the ark, as God instructed in Genesis chapter 8, verses 15 and 17. And here is God's instruction. Then God spoke to Noah, saying, Go out of the ark, you and your wife, and your sons, and your sons' wives with you. Verse 17. Bring out with you every living thing of all flesh that is with you, so that they may abound on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. Notice that when Noah senses that the waters had subsided significantly, just as Dr. David mentioned, he takes the initiative and sends first out a raven and then doves to test the situation. Finally, when the dove does not come back, 
Noah understands, as we read in Genesis chapter 8, verses 13, that the waters were dried up from the earth. And Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked. And indeed, the surface of the earth was dry. The covering of the ark. And you touched on that. And yet, as we read a little while ago, in Genesis chapter 8, verses 15 to 17, Noah only goes out of the ark when God finally tells him to do so. Even though he knows it is safe to leave the ark, Noah chose to rely on God and wait for his signal, his instruction, before going out of the ark. That is remarkable. Ellen G. White, in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 105, makes the following observation. As Noah had entered, uh, had entered at God's command, he waited for special directions to depart. At last, an angel descended from heaven, opened the massive door, and bade the patriarch and his household to go forth upon the earth and take with them every living thing. Noah's behavior is rich and practical in lessons for us today. On one hand, Noah touches us. In, in, in one hand, Noah's lesson teaches us to trust God even when he does not direct or speak about it. And on the other hand, faith does not deny the value of thinking and testing. Faith does not exclude the duty to think, to seek, and to see if what we have learned is indeed true. The ark is proof of the goodness of God as well as of the obedient faith of Noah. The ark became a refuge in time of peril. It became a home for the homeless and a temple where the godly family of, of, of Noah worshipped. But more than that, the ark also took Noah and his family from the old world to the new, from an environment of vice and sin to an earth purified from sin. You see, the ark was God's appointed place of salvation, and outside of it, there was no safety. Matthew 24, 35, 37, our memory text reminds us, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the coming of the Son of Man. This tells me, if you and I desire to be saved, we must be faithful and, tr and trust God. We must be obedient and have the courage to follow his instruction. And we must take advantage of the provision God has made for our salvation. Mark, the covenant. Yeah, thank you. You know, a covenant... <laughs> requires actions from both parties. And what we're going to see, of course, God talks about his action. And we saw that, and we see that in this story of the flood. But we're going to see what Noah does on his part of that covenant here on Wednesday's lesson. You know, we learned um, on Tuesday's lesson that God remembered man through Noah, right? Um, in the, all the, the fact that in the whole world was completely filled with evil. Let's read once again uh, Genesis 6 verses 11 and 12. The earth was corrupt before God and the earth was filled with violence. So the God looked upon the earth and indeed it was corrupt. And for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. In fact, it doesn't actually say man's flesh. It actually says all flesh. All flesh. <laughs> it could be exactly animal right. flesh too. I exactly. mean, it could be really everything there if you wanted to take it that right. literally. And if And we know that but God created a special place for Noah, as we learned. He, he came through this. And we're going to read in Genesis 6, verses 18 again, this, is that, this covenant. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall go into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, your sons' wives, with you. So, our, so Noah was in there for a long time. What, a year? And, what, was it five days? Ten days. Ten days? Ten days. Mm -hmm. year and 10 days. But he was, he was doing this many years. I mean, right. he, this is the culmination of coming, getting through this flood and, and arriving as a culmination of tens of decades, right? I mean, 120 years. 120 years, you said early in the right. beginning. Yeah. Yeah. A long time of preparation. 
So what does Noah do, and what does he do immediately after he lands, or soon after he lands in this new earth, you know, this earth when the waters have receded? And let's read in 828, chapter of Genesis 8, verses 20 to 22, what he does. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. And the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake. <laughs> Although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy every level thing as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, gold and heat, winter and summer, all day and night shall not cease. Mm -hmm. So this was a, so we talked about this, and what did Noah do? This was the first time that he actually gave a sacrifice. I mean, you can imagine kind of comparing this to the creation story. Uh, during the creation story, we had the Lord created the earth in six days, and you can imagine that Adam and Eve probably worshiped with God on that seventh day Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Here, we've come through this, we've come through this survival story of Noah, and here he is providing a sacrifice and you can imagine a worship to the Lord to thank him for saving him. You know, the sacrifice was a burnt offering. In fact, in the Old Testament, this is the oldest and most frequent sacrifice. And this was a thanksgiving offering. Right. Um, we can actually compare this to what God told Moses to tell the, the children of Israel in, and how they are to prepare for thanksgiving. If you go over to Numbers 15, verses 1 to 3, it parallels very much of what Noah did here, but this is many years later. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you have come into the land and you are to inherit, which I am giving you, and you make an offering by the fire of the Lord, a burnt offering for a sacrifice to fulfill a vow or a freewilling offering, or in your appointed feast to make a sweet aroma to the Lord for the herd of the flock. <laughs> Noah was providing his part of that contract, and that contract is to have that relationship with God. And in this case, it was to provide a sacrificial giving, a sacrificial offering as a worship offering. Today, you know, our part in God's covenant, he's given a covenant to us that he will save us. But we do have to hold up our part of that covenant. He wants us to have that relationship with him. Um, similar to what Moses did, different. We don't have to do sacrifices today, but different. He wants that relationship with us. The flood did more than just, um, it did more than just, you know, you know, do a lot of, you know, kind of clean the earth. It also changed the relationship between man and animal. And we're going to read a little bit about this and talk about kind of a new diet uh, condition that happened after the flood. In, in Genesis 9, verses 1 to 4, it talks a little bit about this, and I'll, I'll read through this. So God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be on every beast of the earth and every bird of the air and all that move on the earth and all the fish of the sea. They are giving, they are giving into your hand every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. I have, I have given you all things, even the green herbs, but you shall not eat the flesh with its life. That is its blood. You know, because of the effect of the flood, I, the assumption is that plant food was no longer available to everybody. Couldn't do everything. Before, during creation, God didn't do this, the same instructions. He said that the plant's food would be available for both animals and man. To now, we are seeing a different situation. And you could imagine that in this different situation where God says, you know, all living thing, anything that moves is, could be your food. We'll talk about that, not exactly everything. Um, he talks about, you can see where this relationship could be of fear and dread. In not, Genesis 9, 2, we'll reread it. For the fear of you and the dread of you shall be on every beast of the earth, on every bird of the air. You could imagine that if they're food for us, you could imagine how they could be afraid of us. But there's two stipulations that God pointed out here. One, it was an indirect stipulation, and you could solve that through this, this covenant this, of Noah's um, worship sacrifice and, and what animals he did during his sacrifice, and that specifically those animals were clean animals. So even at this time, 
um, even before the flood, there is this concept of clean animals and unclean. So this is once again um, a kind of a, an indication that we are to eat clean animals. And we're very more specific later um, in Leviticus on this. The other one is, in Genesis 9, 4, it says, we shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. And it talks about how we're not, able, we're not supposed to eat that. Those are the two stipulations for eating of animals. But really, in summary, Noah held up his part of the covenant, and we see that in this section, by worshiping the Lord and obeying his rules, his laws, that's the same for us. You know, that faith relationship with Jesus, the laws that God puts in our part, are part of our responsibility as part of our covenant with God. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mark. Um, David, the, the covenant as, as being a commitment by God to preserve, to preserve life. Yeah. I know that Thursday's lesson addresses that. Absolutely. Unpack it for us. Thank you, Mark, for the beautiful description. Thank you, Victor. Well, the Thursdays is the second part of that covenant. I just want to start this with uh, Psalms 89, 34, mm. 35. Amen. My covenant I will not break, nor alter the word that has gone out of my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. You see, God's holiness is his covenant. He does not change or does not lie. Here, once again, after the flood, God is saying to Noah, just as I promised to Adam, I will redeem you, and this time I will never send flood again. So, let's continue. You see, in the Bible, um, before the Noah's covenant, there's three, roughly three com uh, covenants that were made. The creation covenant is I created, God created the earth in six days and rested on the seventh day. And as, as such, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy as a sign of me being your creator. The word zakar, remember, be active in keeping the Sabbath. Edenic covenant, you can eat from any tree, but do not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Adamic, Adam's covenant with God was the seed of Eve will be the Messiah. And... Uh, with that covenant, the um, wages of sin continued the sufferings, but we didn't have to do anything. Then came flood. It's a whole new world now for Noah and his family. It's beautiful. It's new. But there's still a problem. Human heart is deceptive and wicked, and Satan is still the ruler of the earth. So Noah, like Mark mentioned, built an altar and offered a sacrifice. Now God loved that. He forgave their sin. He even lifted the curse from the ground. Earth is perfect again. So now it's time for God to remind the whole humanity that he is going to come and Messiah is coming. And that is where this covenant begins. Genesis 9, 11. There thus I establish my covenant with you. Never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood, never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. See, the humans, we are not expected to do anything in this new covenant except to remember and to believe. See, um, the covenant and its signs are a reminder of the end of, uh, of this original creation that was Sabbath. It's the similar covenant. Genesis 8.22, God never gave up on his creation. After Noah came out, he committed to preserve life on earth, and everything must go on according to his will in order. Let's read Genesis 9, 9, 10, 12, and 17. I think it's important. As for me, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, all of that do go out of the ark every beast of the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations, not just one generation, forever. I set my rainbow in the cloud and it shall be for the sign of the covenant between you and me and the earth. And, Lord, and God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant which I have set established between me and all flesh that is on earth. 
See, the covenant is with all flesh, with earth, and rainbow is assigned to earth and all flesh, that God is committed to preserve human life and the life of all his creation. See, Luke 17, 1, 2 says yeah, um, that we will have stumbling blocks in our life, but it would be better for them to be thrown into the sea with millstone tied around their neck than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. You see, the, before the flood, the earth was full of stumbling blocks. People didn't care about anybody. Okay, so when the flood really came, guess what? They knew they didn't know how to swim. They, it was kind of like a millstone tying around their neck as they were drowning. What an you know, incredible analogy that Jesus was giving, right? So the judgment of flood was to preserve life and life abundantly. See, life with Jesus is sinful life. It's not really life. It is a rebellious life, and it's a rebellion against our fellow brothers and sisters. You know the Ten Commandments? It can be summarized by loving our brothers and sisters, our neighbors. And, lie, and before the flood, that was non-existent. So, God never gave up on humanity. He gave us the rainbow. He established that covenant. It's repeated three times in Genesis 9, 9, 11, and 17. Why? Because God talked about it in Genesis 6, 18 to Noah. That, when, what that means is that God is telling us it's fulfilled. You don't have to worry about it because I do not lie. That is my holiness, right? So, we, but God still has to solve that problem of human nature. Like Paul said, I do the things that I should not do and I do not do the things that I should do because there is sin in me. So what does God do? Like Victor said, God doesn't recreate human beings eventually. In the end times, just like the cre uh, recreation, he's going to restore a new heaven and new earth and humanity will become again. Um, his, he, he will reflect the image and likeness of God. Um, you know, I wanted to um, uh, bring up the word remember. The word is zakar. Right. In Hebrew language, in Hebrew Bible, it is a very important word. It means to employ your hands and feet and lips to engage in whatever action that remembrance requires. Yeah. So when we look up at the rainbow, even if we don't want to believe, even if the science telling us something else, we have to do whatever it takes to believe it. Same thing with Sabbath. No matter what it takes for us, but we have to be actively in, involved in that same sign. Okay? Sabbath is a sign for men to remember the covenant promise that God is the creator, the redeemer, who will create a new heaven and a new earth for the ones who have the patience to faithfully keep the commandments of God and put their trust in Jesus Christ. He will do that again through Jesus. See, when the um, um, recreation, um, you know, recreation that happened in flood, I just found this really interesting. The author uh, talks about this, that the recreation and the Genesis 1 versus Genesis 8, there's a parallel. There's like God remembers, and it's kind of like one to five days, and then God speaks in day six, and then day seven is kind of like he gives the sign, just like he gives Sabbath at the end of the creation. This is, this is a remarkable, um, you know, uh, knowledge that I, it's like David said, it is high, I cannot attain it. It's a mystery, right? But now I, I, I see the light, and I want to uh, encourage all of you guys to really study this, because this is incredible. You see, in the structure of flood story, the rainbow parallels the Sabbath in the creation account. The, the rainbow and the Sabbath are only two entities identified in the Bible as a cosmic sign of covenant. The rainbow appearing in heavens, encompassing earth, is the sign of his covenant with his new creation, paralleling the Sabbath in his initial creation. The Sabbath is lived in human time as the sign of his covenant with his people. It was before flood, during the flood, and after the flood. So, what, what, is, what is to make out of it? Let Exodus 31, 16, 17. God says that children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath throughout all generations. Now, a lot of people say it's only for the Jewish people. But remember, it was in creation. It was with Noah. It was afterwards before Abraham. And they were not Jewish. In fact, as Christians, we know we are spiritual Jewish people. And all of laws of God apply. But the sign, the two signs, rainbow and Sabbath, very important. 
Very important. Okay, now, um, you know, God is sovereign over all things, and rainbow is his, is his sign of his sovereignty to us. And Sabbath is our acknowledgement of his so sovereignty. Sabbath and rainbow truly represents the covenant relationship between man and God. Okay, that is very important because rainbow, God's sign, God is telling us, and Sabbath is our sign that God is the creator. Both of them, both of them shows that God has power over all things and he can save everything. So if God is not the creator, then Christ can't be the redeemer. So rainbow shows us that God is the creator and keeping the Sabbath acknowledges that God is the creator and Jesus is the redeemer. So let's, um, you know, the rainbow also in uh, one interesting thing in Revelation, rainbow represents God, Revelation 4.3. And one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby, a rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. It's the seal. It's God's presence. It's his royalty. So while and Mrs. Ellen White writes, starts from the Mount of Blessing. While we were yet unloving and unlovely in character, hateful and hating one another, how our Heavenly Father had mercy on us. After that, the kindness and love of God, our Savior toward man, appeared not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Rainbow and Sabbath, these are God's mercy to us. So we can be with him in the end. Thank you. Amen. Thanks so much, David. Mark, yep. any final words from you? Yeah. Um, you know, Noah um, was chosen to save humankind because he listened to God. And as Ellen White said, he was a master builder. And I love that, uh, that vision of him being a master builder. Right. You know, and, and it calls us, and as a, I envision this as a master builder, because in fact, this last weekend I was working on some yard furniture. Mm -hmm. I was trying to be a master builder. I'm not very good, but I was trying to be. But, but I can imagine that, that with this idea of being a master builder, wouldn't it be great if we were master builders for Jesus' message, just Amen. like Noah was? Amen. Amen. Um, you know, it, it doesn't have to be with words, because Noah didn't do it with just words. He did it with right. actions, right? He built right. this huge ark right. with kindness and with sympathy to others, especially as this world progresses, and we know that it's going to be down. We're going to be, we're going to, we're going to be as master builders, we're going to stand out, just like Noah stood out right. at that time. We're going to stand out, and the goal and the hope is that we will bring more people, more master builders with us, Let's be master builders for Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, David. It's been really wonderful. I want to really uh, close the Sabbath School discussion, this meeting that we've had today, with an appeal and thoughts from the pen of inspiration. And I want to go to uh, uh, Prophets and Kings, pages 275 and 278. Prophets and Kings. And this is an appeal for you and for me today. Here's how Ellen White writes, and she begins by painting the picture. From age to age, this is page 275 of Prophets and Kings. From age to age, Satan has sought to keep man in ignorance of the bene beneficent designs of Jehovah. Jehovah is our God. He has endeavored to remove from their sight the great things of God's law, the principles of justice and mercy and love their reign set forth. Men boast of the wonderful progress and enlightenment of the age in which we are now living. But God sees the earth filled with iniquity and violence. Men declare that the law of God has been abrogated that the Bible is not authentic, and as a result, a tide of evil, such as has not been seen uh, since the days of Noah and of apostate Israel, is sweeping over the world. Nobility of soul, gentleness, piety, are battered away to gratify the lust for forbidden things. Ellen White paints the picture, and then she says, Our God is a God of mercy. 
Today's lesson was a lesson of love and mercy and judgment. Then she goes on and says, God's message for the inhabitants of the earth today is, Matthew 24, verses 44, Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. And then she goes on and, and says, The conditions prevailing in society, and especially in the great cities of the nations, proclaim in thunder tones that the hour of God's judgment is come and that the end of all things uh, earthly is at hand. We are standing on the threshold of the crisis of the ages, she says. She says, in quick succession, the judgment of God will follow one another, fire and flood and earthquake with war and bloodshed. And then she says, we are not to be surprised at this time by events both great and, and decisive, for the angel of mercy cannot remain much longer to shelter the impenitent. I want to end by taking you to the last chapter of, of the Bible, chapter 22 of Revelation. And here's what the Lord says. In this chapter, Jesus is testifying to the church and tells us, you and I, Behold, says Jesus, I am coming quickly. My reward is with me to give it to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. And I say, Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, Come soon. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for your amazing grace. For Lord, all you have continually shown to mankind has been an agape love, a great desire to always bridge re reconciliation and bring it about. Lord, all you've shown is grace and love and mercy. And Father, I want to thank you. I want to thank you not only for what happened in Noah's day and the grace and the mercy that you had in providing a recreation that really didn't quite work the way perhaps it should have. And then, Lord, I want to thank you that you came to this earth. You put on full and men's mental on. And Lord, without any sin and ever, ever sinning, you lived with us so, called, so, so that you could touch us, reach out to us. And then on that horrible death at the cross, you paid our price so that we could earn the eternal life that is yours. I want to thank you for that. Lord, help us through the difficult days we are facing in this world. We truly are at the end of time. Touch our hearts in a way that we can give ourselves totally to you. Lord, out, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is my prayer for you today. That we, Lord, not only open our doors, the doors of our hearts to you, but that we give you the, our hearts so that you may purify them. So that we may love you with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and with all our strength. Thank you, Father, for your amazing grace. For I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Happy Sabbath. Happy, Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Thank you so much Thank you. for being with us today. Happy Sabbath. Thanks, guys.